Welcome to History 361, the history of Germany. This is week seven. Pastor Mark Niemöller, who was born in 1892, lived during the Nazi era, and at first he was actually anti-Semitic and a supporter of Hitler. Then when Hitler began to take over control to Nazify the Christian churches, Niemöller helped to establish the dissident confessing church, and for his actions was in prison in concentration camps at Sachsenhausen and Dachau. What did Niemöller have to write? He said, first they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. And then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. And then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Today we're going to discuss the Great Depression, totalitarianism, and World War II. After World War I, which uh, Germany, of course, and uh, lost, and the Central Powers lost, uh, there were negotiations at Versailles, which led to the creation of a number of different countries, and we've already been through what all those negotiations were about in our last lecture. The Weimar Republic was created in Germany in 1919, and actually it, it had a lot going for it. It was a pretty liberal democracy, which included um, both uh, male and female uh, suffrage, that is the right to vote, and it included a lot of wonderful um, measures for health care, etc. Uh, but the one problem which it faced was um, the whole cloud of World War I, the war reparations which were vindictive and punitive, and uh, an economic situation that proved to be uh, largely out of its control and collapse. To give an example, in 1914, at the beginning of World War I, the exchange rate of the German uh, mark to the U.S. dollar was 4.2 to 1. 4.2 to 1. So for every U.S. dollar, you know, you'd have four marks in equivalency. Now, by November of 1923, just four years later, the exchange rate of the German mark to the U.S. dollar was 4.2 trillion to one. Now, I'm not making these figures up. You can't make something like this up. It was, it was why people needed to have, you know, wheelbarrows full of money to go to the store to buy anything significant. Um, this is what is called hyperinflation. Now, meanwhile, looking at the world in general and what was happening, the Great Depression began in October 1929 in the U.S. And at that time, Herbert Hoover was president. He did not win re-election. Instead, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, became president and inaugurated the U New Deal in the United States, including things like the Work Progress Administration, Social Security, etc. So the U.S. sought to fight the Great Depression by inaugurating some programs to put people back to work, to put money into people's pockets, but it did not go the route of socialism, it did not go the route of communism, and it did not go the route of totalitarianism. On the other hand, a lot of places, not a lot, but a significant number, went other routes to try to solve the Great Depression, which by that time spread worldwide and helped to fuel totalitarianism. So what do we need to know about totalitarianism? Well, let's look at the root total in that word and realize that what it actually stood for was total control. Um, if you defined it officially, you would say that totalitarian states were those that were politically and economically highly, highly centralized, anti-liberal, highly controlling, even invasive in their attitude toward their very citizens, and militaristic. 
So you might say, well, how does totalitarianism really differ from absolutism or authoritarianism? And we had certainly seen absolutism in, in some of the uh, Habsburg emperors of, uh, of Austria, Hungary, and we certainly seen absolutism in Frederick the Great of Prussia. But the difference with absolutism with leaders like Frederick the Great and others were that they were limited in their power and even more importantly in their objectives. And by that we mean that they had neither the, the ability nor the desire to control you know, virtually all aspects of their subjects' lives. And this was something that um, totalitarianism would not respect, and that is the very nature of many of their subjects' lives. Of course, totalitarianism was the complete antithesis of classical liberalism. Classical liberalism, which had grown up in the Enlightenment and which stood for the very effort to limit the powers of government, to limit the powers of the state, and to protect the sacred rights of the individual. An example of totalitarianism was the Soviet Union, which after the death of Lenin expressed itself in the totalitarianism of Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin, for instance, wanted to take the, the small agricultural holdings of the peasants to combine them together in big collective farms. He forced this on the peasants with a resulting death of as many as 10 million people. Furthermore, in his great purges of the 1930s against those who opposed him, at least 8 million were arrested, and of these millions were executed or died in prisons or work camps. Now, before we begin World War II, we want to get some other terminology straight. Just as a reminder here, a review, the First Reich was the Holy Roman Empire, the Second Reich was Bismarck's Germany, and the Third Reich was Hitler's Germany. An example of totalitarianism was fascism, which spread throughout Europe and included Hitler's Nazi Germany, Mussolini's Italy, and Francisco Franco's Spain. In 1922, Benito Mussolini seized power in Italy and began fascism in Italy, which he himself described as, quote, everything in the state, nothing outside the state, nothing against the state. Italy never really became a totalitarian sense in the same state in the same sense as the Soviet Union or Germany, never the less it was a fascist state. In 1931, in Asia, Japan invaded Manchuria, a part of China rich in oil and railroads. If you uh, want to know more about this, then this is a, uh, an advertisement for taking my History of Japan class, which a number of you have already done so. In 1933, Hitler came to power in Germany as head of the Nazi party. Um, the Nazis and fascism were anti-communist, anti-socialist. And so don't be, you know, don't be confused by the National Socialist Party, you know, the Nazis. They were, they were not the kind of socialists that you're thinking of, the communist kind of socialists. They were very anti-communist, very anti-socialist. Um, Hitler really came to power using the Jews as a scapegoat, blaming Jewish bankers and businessmen for uh, the defeat, Germany's defeat in World War I. They, they could not see how a country with a military as strong as Germany would have won, would have lost, excuse me, would have lost World War I had it not been for someone behind the scenes pulling the strings, making certain that that happened. This intense anti-Semitism, you know, there had been anti-Semitism in Germany that, you know, dated back to the Middle Ages. We've seen that in 
in uh, our book, uh, The Pity of It All, um, by uh, Amos Elon. But on the other hand, this was an anti-Semitism that we will see was more intense than anything the world had ever seen before. In 1935, Mussolini of Italy invaded Ethiopia, and Italy and Germany entered into an alliance as the Axis powers. In 1936, there was civil war in Spain. The phalangist of Francisco Franco staged a revolt, and Franco, who was a fascist, was supported by Hitler and Mussolini. In 1936, Germany moved into the Rhineland and remilitarized it. The significance of this is, of course, at the treaty negotiations ending World War I, remember the Rhineland was to be demilitarized. So what Hitler was doing here is saying the Rhineland belongs to us. He was remilitarizing something that had been demilitarized at the end of World War I, which was a complete disregard for Versailles and all of the related treaties. In 1938, Germany declared an Anschluss with Austria. That is a, a merger, a union with Austria, as German troops moved into Austria. Um, you know, this is depicted, of course, in The Sound of Music, where Baron von Trapp, who, you know, was a hero of uh, the Austrian army, or navy, excuse me, navy, in World War I, you know, expressed his dissatisfaction, could not imagine that the Nazis were moving in, and of course fled Austria with his family um, for the United States. All of which, of course, you know, they took some, some poetic license with, as Hollywood often does. You know, they, they really escaped in, in a train and, and, and not walking over the mountains, but be that as it may, uh, what you need to understand about the Von Trapp family is that they were a minority. Many people in Austria uh, supported this Anschluss with Germany, saw it as an opportunity for a German-speaking area like Austria to regain its former prestige and to become a world power. So as a wonderful old nun who had been my professor years ago said, the Austrians were not exactly kicking and screaming when the German troops marched into Austria and declared the Anschluss. In 1938, Hitler expressed his desire to take the Sudetenland from Czechoslovakia. So uh, the British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain, uh, along uh, with uh, so Britain and France, uh, met um, with other negotiators at the Munich Conference in Munich, Germany, and decided to allow Hitler to take the Sudetenland. Uh, the negotiations on the way home, Neville Chamberlain said that we have achieved peace in our time. Uh, it certainly was uh, an expression which he could never live down after that because, as we know, giving Hitler just a little was not going to satiate his greater demands. And, of course, peace in our time would not be achieved. In fact, the following year, Hitler occupied the remaining areas of Czechoslovakia and he signed a non-aggression non pact with Soviet Union, of course, which was his about as valuable as the paper that it was printed on because Hitler could not be trusted, Stalin could not be trusted, um, and it certainly do, though did give Hitler some uh, breathing time. In fact, Hitler went ahead and, on September 1st of 1939 and attacked uh, Poland. Great Britain and France declared war on Germany two days later. Using Blitzkrieg lightning war, the Germans defeated Poland in only four weeks. And meanwhile, when Germany invaded Poland, the Soviet Union overran rather quickly Little Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania, and Eastern Europe, and then Finland. In 1940, Winston Churchill became Prime Minister of Great Britain. Germany invaded Denmark and Norway, swept across the Netherlands and Belgium, and finally France, while Italy invaded France from the south. France fell on June 22nd, and on June 23rd, French General Charles de Gaulle 
formed a government in exile in London. Meanwhile, the Vichy government of France, led by French General Marshal Pétain, collaborated with Germany. On July 10th of 1940, the Germans began the Battle of Britain as German airplanes first attacked military and industrial targets in the United Kingdom, but by September they were attacking civilian ones, including British cities at night, like London in the so-called Blitz. Germany turned on the Soviet Union, invaded it in 1941 when Nazi submarines began attacked against American ships, and on December 7th, 1941, a day which FDR said will live in infamy. The Japanese attacked the American naval base at Pearl Harbor in Honolulu and Maui in Hawaii, and, uh, and Honolulu in Oahu in Hawaii. A very moving place to go, by the way, if you've never been there and to visit the, the shrine there in the, uh, Ariz the USS Arizona, etc. The next day, the United States declared war on Japan. On December 11th, Germany and Italy declared war against the U.S., and the U.S. declared war against Germany and Italy. In 1942-43, the tide of war began to turn in favor of the Allies with a major Ally victory at El Alamein in North Africa in October, a major German loss at Stalingrad in the Soviet Union in January-February of 1943, so that at Casablanca, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Winston Churchill sat down in January 1943 and decided upon their next move, an invasion of Sicily. Subsequent invasions of Sicily and the Italian peninsula took place, and by 1944, Italy fell. Then the great D-Day invasion of the Allies took place on June 6, 1945. The Allied invasion to take back France at the beaches of Normandy involved 4,000 vessels and a million men. By August, Paris was liberated in, De in December of that year. There was a significant Allied victory at the Battle of the Bulge. By 1945, at Yalta and the Crimea, FDR, Churchill, and Stalin sat down with those from France to, to determine that at the end of the war, each would control their own zones of occupation in Germany to be determined by the position of their troops at the time that the war would end. All three also agreed to set up a new organization for, net, for uh, worldwide security called the United Nations. 1945, the, the Pacific Theater, Iwo Jima, a hard-fought battle of the U.S. Marines, the bloodiest battle in the history of the Marine Corps. The U.S. lost over 20,000 men, but they landed on Iwo Jima, set only 750 miles from Tokyo. The end was near. April 30th, Hitler committed suicide in his bunker. On May 8th, VE, standing for Victory in Europe Day, was announced. Germany surrendered, and by November, the Nuremberg trials began of those accused of war crimes. In 1945, Truman met with Allied leaders at Potsdam. They issued an ultimatum demanding that the Japanese surrender by August 3rd, or, quote, face uttered destruction, end quote. The Japanese refused to surrender, so on August 6th of 1949, an American B-29 airplane, the Enola Gay, dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima. Between 80 and 200,000 people died instantly. Still, the Japanese refused to surrender, so three days later, on August 9th, the U.S. dropped an atomic bomb on Nagasaki. And on September 2nd, aboard the USS Missouri, the Japanese surrender. One of the saddest moments, of course, of World War II, and there were many sad moments, was the Holocaust. The Nazi persecution and extermination of Jews, homosexuals, gypsies, and others. Between the years of 1933 and 1939, Jews in Germany were subjected to arrest, economic boycott, the loss of civil rights and, and citizenship, incarceration, random violence, and November 9th and 10th of 1938, Kristallnacht, which literally means crystal night or the night of broken glass. During that evening, the German government systematically destroyed, in a horrific move, Jewish businesses and synagogues. In October of 1939, Hitler ordered T4, a secret euthanasia program, a euthanasia program against 
and this is a sad list. The mentally retarded, the mentally ill, the physically handicapped, chronically ill children, deformed children, elderly residents of nursing homes, and they gassed many of their victims to death at sanatoria. The German public and the Catholic Church complained, so the program was officially discontinued, but in reality, it continued secretly. They simply, the Nazis simply changed their methods from gassing to lethal injections given in hospitals and clinics. There were an estimated 275,000 victims of euthanasia. On July 31, 1941, the final solution was determined on Hitler's orders that there were to be, quote, all necessary preparations for bringing about the complete solution of the Jewish question, end quote. In December of that year, the first extermination camp Chelmno began gassing Jews. On January 20th of 1942, the, at the Wannsee Conference in Berlin, Hitler's plans for the final solution of the Jews, already underway, were outlined. It would involve an estimated 11 million Jews throughout Europe. In fact, all European Jews were, be, were to be deported to camps where they would die either from forced labor or from direct extermination. Germany established six major extermination camps in occupied Poland at Chelmna, Belzac, Zobibor, Treblinka, Auschwitz, Birkenau, and Maginek. And at these six camps, about half of all of the victims of the Holocaust died. The aftermath of the Holocaust was about six million Jews which would have been about one-third of the world's Jewish population at the time, and one million other victims, including homosexuals, gypsies, Jehovah Witnesses, etc., died in the Holocaust. It's somewhat unfathomable how this could happen, how millions of Germans could be involved in this through either complicity, complicity or apathy. But we have to remember that fear and propaganda rely upon deceit. And deceit simply is trying to make something evil seem good. Um, that is something difficult for us to understand. But the vast majority of people, of good people, will not go for something evil unless you can, through propaganda, convince them that what is actually evil is actually a good. And that is how millions died. Worldwide, World War II led to the deaths of 60 million soldiers and civilians and 30 million European refugees were without homes. Any questions, please feel free to email or phone me. I'm always happy to help. Have a good week.